Good morning, everyone. So we're going to do our reading lesson. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to do our reading lesson this morning about analysing texts. So our aims and outcomes are to use information in text to answer a question for a particular purpose. You should identify when not to give an unsubstantiated opinion when giving suitable responses. You should be able to examine levels of formality, including recognising passive voice and subordinate clauses. You should recognise bias through a range of devices and methods. You could give answers to questions that require analysis and suitable responses with clear information. So analysing texts and considering responses. At level two, you'll be expected to understand and analyse the text and use the information in the text to provide an appropriate response. These sorts of questions mean you have to use the information to answer another question. It's more than a simple comprehension activity. So you need to support your answer with evidence from the document or text and to make sure that you address the question. You must give a clear choice considering the text in detail. You need to provide a comprehensive explanation supported by examples. So when answering these questions, it's not about what you already know even if the question is a topic that you personally know a lot about, it's about using the text you've been given in the assessment to provide the evidence for your answers. So I've got some examples here of the type of questions you might be asked in the level two assessment. Your friend thinks that flexible working is a good idea. Use document two to say whether you agree or not. So it's specifying where to find your evidence. Your friend wants to apply for work experience. Use document one to advise what they should do. So it's specifying which text to use, document one, and also what evidence you're looking for how to apply for work experience. Your friend believes that aid doesn't work. Use the information from document three to change her mind. So in this case, you're looking for evidence in document three and you want to change her mind from believing aid doesn't work. So the evidence you're looking for is evidence that aid does work because you want to change her mind. And finally, analyse all three documents or compare document X to document Y and explain which document is the most biased. So you're looking for one-sided opinions bias and you're going to explain that by comparing the documents, you're going to explain which one does not give an overview, but just gives one side of the argument. So how to tackle these questions? You need to support your answers with clear information. So it's a good start to look for any facts or figures that are in the text that could back up your opinion. 
So remember, as I've already mentioned, it's not about what you know personally, but what you can find in the text to use as evidence. So in this question, your friend believes that aid doesn't work. Use information from document three to change her mind. You need to find evidence in the document that aid does work, even if it's something that you're really knowledgeable about. Um, humanitarian aid, for example, um, you're really, really aware of it. Perhaps you work in that field. That doesn't matter. What you what matters is what you can for the purpose of the assessment. What evidence is in the document specified? That's what the um, assessor will be looking for and for you to gain your marks. So make sure you're using evidence from the document. So have a go. So have a look at these questions. What, what kind of evidence would you need to focus on? Your friend thinks that the new shopping centre is only a retail destination. Use text A to explain what else the shopping centre can offer. So what sort of evidence do you think you'd be looking for in the text? What sort of examples could you give? do you think, to explain what else the shopping centre can offer? So we don't have text day in front of us, so we've got to think what sort of evidence would we be looking for so we can explain what else the shopping centre offers apart from just retail. So what do you what do you think? So you might be looking for um <coughs> excuse me. So you'd be looking for um examples of non retail businesses or experiences within the shopping centre. So you'd be looking in text day. What else does it mention apart from shops? Does it mention cinema, bowling? Is there a health centre or a gym? So that kind of information. Okay, the second one, your friend wants to take a gap year but is struggling with cash. Use text B to advise how they could go about raising some money. So with that one, you're going to be looking for examples of earning or raising money so that this person can take a gap year. So you'd be looking in text B for examples, for evidence of what they could do to earn some money. Your friend wants to take... Oh, it's the same one. Um, so... If after the session or at some point during the week you log into Moodle, the online, um, the online system for your courses, then there are some activities there that you can use to practice those skills. So it's worth logging on and checking those and having a go. And that will enable you to practice this, those vital skills that you need for level two. So formality versus informality. So you will need to be able to recognise the levels of formalities in the text you're reading. So we've got four sentences here. And we're going to put them in order of formality or you are going to put them in order of formality. From the most formal, so starting with the most formal, to the least formal. So have a think about what makes a sentence formal or informal. And then you need to think about what order they go in. So if you can read those yourself from the screen and then decide what order they should go in. So I'll give you a few moments to read them. 
and then I would like someone to suggest uh, the order or at least start us off by suggesting which is the most formal. So take a, take a, couple, a minute or two to read them. Okay, so which of those sentences is the most formal? So you'll need to unmute yourself, but I would like someone to suggest an answer here. Which one is the most formal? So we're looking at the language used, the vocabulary. The grammar, which one is most formal? So someone have, have a go. It's not, it doesn't matter if it's not the right answer because we can discuss it. So if you just have a go, somebody. Which one is most formal? Okay, so Randon thinks number two. So yes, number two is the most formal. It's not gonna let me move it for some reason. Okay, just hold on one moment. Uh, so, sorry about this. There we go. Okay, so Number two is the most formal. Good. What? Which other of those sentences is still slightly formal, but a little bit less than number two? So could someone suggest for us? Thank you, Randon, again, number three. So you can unmute yourself if you want to tell us. So number three, the modern gastropub is a pleasant and memorable experience with lots to savour and enjoy. Okay, well done. And now we're looking for something which is not, not really formal. So number one or number four? So we've got kids are more of a presence in restaurants these days. And when I went with my lot, they absolutely loved it. Or the restaurant's okay, I wasn't allowed to smoke. So we've got one, two, which one's next? Which one should come next in the order of formality? So one or four. One. Good. So why did you choose one rather than four? 
you're right, but what what made you choose number three? Or can anyone else tell me? Sorry, number one. Can anyone else tell me why number one is the next? So number one, the sentence is more complex. So number four is our least formal. And that's because it's it's not only has it got um, contractions such, such as restaurants rather than restaurant is and wasn't rather than was not. The sentences are really short. So it's so the complexity of the sentence can add to the formality. OK, but number three is still informal my lot so rather than my family he said my lot and he's used the words kids rather than children okay this uh number um number two here we've got it's formal it's a complex sentence it's got a subordinate clause it has got technical vocabulary. It is rather than it's. Okay. And we've still got that here. We've got gastropub. Um, saver. Okay. It's, it's, it's still a relatively um, complex sentence. Okay. Oops. So let me just rub those out. So, yes, yeah, so it's the same order that we put them in here, just to show you. So most formal to least formal. And you need to be able to recognise that when you are reading the text. So we can look at the features here of those sentences. And the grey boxes show us the features. So the first sentence, it is believed that the arrival to our shores of the gastronome, Raymond Blanc Sr. in the 1970s, transformed British cooking forever. So we've got the passive voice there, which we'll speak a little bit more about in a few minutes. The passive voice, it is believed. We've got technical vocabulary, gastronome and that subordinate clause and um, it's the whole thing is one sentence it's a long complex sentence and all of those features contribute to its formality and the second sentence the modern gastro pub is a pleasant and memorable experience with lots to savor and enjoy it's still a relatively long and complex sentence um, we've still got some formal vocabulary, pleasant, memorable, savour. Okay, so the next one. Kids are a more kids are more of a presence in restaurants these days. And when I went with my lot, they absolutely loved it. So it's still a, a long sentence, but it's got colloquial language. Kids, my lot. And the final one, the restaurant's okay, I wasn't allowed to smoke. So short, simple sentences and contractions, restaurant instead of restaurant is and wasn't instead of was not. So contractions um, generally will show us that some of the uh, text is less formal. Um, a more formal text, we wouldn't use contractions. Any questions about that? So features of formal and informal language. So longer and or technical words avoids contractions. So we could see that in this sentence. It is rather than it's our technical vocabulary. Gastronome. 
the third person. So it is not I or you who is who's the voice of that sentence. It's the third person, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. It avoids cliches. So you wouldn't, in a formal document, you wouldn't read things like um, sold like hotcakes. You would have sold extremely well. So you don't see those cliches. And it avoids the second person pronouns. If it needs to use one, it will use one. So uh, one can see in this sentence so it's using one rather than um, you. And formal language um, will also avoid the imperative voice. So it's, if you like, it's more polite. So it's, it will say, um, please refer to rather than just refer to. And the passive voice, which, as I mentioned, we'll look a little bit more at. And as we saw in those sentences, they were long, the more formal sentences were longer, more complex, and also had subordinate clauses. So an informal text is more likely to have shorter, simple sentences. So let's have a look at the informal language. So colloquialism, so everyday type language, more speech-like, kids, guy, awesome, and so on. Contractions, so can't, won't, didn't, and so on. So the use of the first and second person, such as I, you, and we, and cliches. So as I mentioned, sold like hot cakes, you're more likely to find those cliches in an informal text. Direct address, so you, you will love this, you would love it if you visited this restaurant, so on. So using commands such as listen or imperatives, listen, uh, do this, pick up this, choose and so on. Using the active voice, we have seen that. So again, we'll look at that in a moment. And as I mentioned, short and simple sentences are much more likely to be found in informal text. Um, you will find short sentences in formal text, but there won't be as many of them. Whereas in an informal text, they will, they will be uh, the most common type of sentence. Any questions about formal and informal language? Okay. So we're going to look at the passive and active voice. And the active voice is the most common way of speaking in English. So you can see in this sentence, he designed many classic cars in the 90s, in the 60s. So the sentence starts with the subject, he, followed by the verb, designed. It's in the past tense in this sentence. He designed, subject, verb. And then the object, what did he design? Many classic cars. So the active voice, subject, verb, object. Looking at the passive voice, we can see that it's slightly different. So we've got many classic cars were designed in the 1960s. So we're starting with the object, what was designed, the classic cars. That starts the sentence. Many classic cars were, so the verb to be in the past, were. So that's a big clue for the passive voice. And then again, the past firm form of the verb de designed. So many classic cars were designed. So object, verb to be, and then the past verb. Okay. 
So there's an example of the general same meaning, but shown in the active voice and the passive voice. So in the passive form, the object, which in this case is the classic cars, moves to the start of the sentence because it is often more important than the subject. It is often seen in formal writing, particularly where there's a process involved, such as the engine is started. Okay, any questions so far? So remember with the active voice, we will be starting with the subject, then the verb. So have a look at these sentences and we're going to decide, are they active or passive? So just read through them and have a think for a moment about whether they are active or passive. Okay, the first sentence, a key is used to open the gate. Is that the active or passive voice? Yes, active. I think so. Passive. Okay. So what makes you think it's the active voice? Thank you for, for giving us an answer. What makes you think it's the active voice? It said open the gate. So it means uh, it's, uh, it's not said open. So if we look at the active voice okay. here, We've got he, or we could change that for a name. Bob designed many classic cars. So we'd have the subject, then the verb. Oops, apologies, just hold on. So in this case, we don't have the subject and then the verb. Okay, let's. so this one is passive. passive. Yep. Okay. A key is used. Okay. So okay. It, it, to make it active, we could change it to he used a key to open the gate. That would make it the active voice. Okay. So a key is used, or, and that's the passive voice. For it to be the active voice, it would say, he used a key to open the gate. Okay, so it tells us exactly who's who's doing the uh, using the key. Right, Michael. Um, his that's, that's, it. that's active. That's, I think so. It is active. So we've got that. We've got Michael. What's his action? He's donating. He's do he donated his match fee. So we know straight away what Michael did, what his action was. Michael donated his match fee, the subject and the verb. The charity was founded. So That's passive, this one, I think. Passive. So. Well done. Mm -hmm. um, the verb to be in the past was. So in this sentence, it was were, but in the sentence we're looking at was. So the charity was founded. Well done. Mm -hmm. That's passive. Roses were planted there in June. That's passive. Uh, active. This one, I'm active. Um, so, pardon? Active. I think so, active. active. This one is active. So, again, this one's passive because we've we've got some clues here. We've got this Where? verb 
past tense, were planted, were. If it was to be active, we could change it to active by saying um, the, the woman planted the roses there in June. Was, yeah, we sorry for that. And um, so if we have a look here, um, it's starting with the object. Oh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. It's starting with the object roses and then the verb. Okay. They were sad to leave. That one active. Where? They. It starts with. <laughs> it starts with the subject. They oh, were I... to leave. So it starts with the subject and then the verb. So they were. Okay. So it is it, that's something you need you need to um if you're not sure then you need to do some practice with that. Um, so okay, have a look at. Um, you can access this recording next week, and you can have a look again at this slide, this and look at how the active voice, how that sentence is written: the subject, the verb, and then the object. But in the passive verb, we've got the object then the verb uh, to be followed by the past form of the verb. So object, verb, verb. So I think that's something that everyone would benefit from having another look at. Um, okay. You can also, a really good website, it's not, it's not based on functional skills, but it has really clear... Um, Grammar, punctuation, um, language, um, um, information on is the BBC Bite Size. So you, it, it, um, it has, if you look up passive and active voice on there, then you should be able to find some information and that will give you some extra practice some extra learning there so bbc bite size and just search for passive and active voice as okay. i said it's not it, it won't necessarily say it's functional skills it might come under um gcse or other but it's the same it's the same information about um grammar and so on so it's a it's a good place to look for uh, to have some additional information, but the active voice starting with the subject, the then object, the passive voice, we've got the object, then the verb to be, and the verb of the sentence. Okay, any questions? Okay, so we have looked at direct command previously. And informal language uses imperatives, which is another name for direct commands. So examples of this are things we see on advertising. Buy now. Pay later. So it's not saying, um, it's not using um, you before the verb. It's just, it's commanding that you do it. It's not saying, please, could you buy now, pay later. It's directing you to do that. So buy now, pay later. Change your lifestyle with a low carb diet. Go to Spain and see. So they are more immediate, emotional and personal, which is why they're often used in advertising. 
fact that because they are an effective way to persuade people to do something. Okay. But in formal language, the use of imperatives or direct command is avoided. So um, what we might see there is some, um, excuse me. So what we would see is that it's a bit more polite. So please refer to diagram B. If you prefer, you could sell your car through auto supermarket. Visiting Turkey is a delight. So it's a bit more distant. Um, there's, it's not got that urgency to it of do it now. And it, there's less emotion to it. OK, so any questions about direct command? So again, it's just another way for you to identify formal language and informal language. So formal, avoiding imperatives or direct command. But if you can see that the text has direct command, it's most likely to be informal. Subordinate clauses. So a subordinate clause adds information to a main clause, but does not make sense on its own. So if we have a look at these sentences, I want you to identify the subordinate clause. So the subordinate clause will usually come um, after a comma and then that will finish with a comma. And it's additional information in the sentence. But if we took it away, the sentence would still make sense. So in the first sentence, the Pope, who turned 64 on Wednesday, left for Brazil last night. What part of that sentence is a subordinate clause? So what part of that sentence could we take away and we'd still have a sentence that makes sense? The Pope, who turned 64 on Wednesday, left for Brazil last night. Left for Brazil last night. So, okay. So if we say that this is oh, if we say this is the subordinate clause, this part at the end, left for Brazil last night, does this part make sense on its own? The Pope who turned sixty four on Wednesday, does that make sense now? No, no, no. It's it's unfinished, isn't it? So yeah. it's not the left for Brazil last night. So that's part of our main sentence. So do you want to have another go? Or can anybody else help us here? What's the additional information? So we know now that left for Brazil is part of our main sentence. So which part is additional? Turn 64. Good. Um, yeah. So our subordinate clause is here. Who turned 64 on Wednesday? The Pope left for Brazil last night. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? The Pope left for Brazil last night. Yeah. That makes sense on its own, doesn't it? That's a complete sentence. But the writer has added some information about the Pope. He's telling us he had his birthday last week and what his age is. 
So if we just read the subordinate clause, who turned 64 on Wednesday? Does that make a sentence on its own? Who turned 64 on Wednesday? It doesn't it doesn't make a complete it sentence, does it? Yeah. yeah, so it's 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 just part of a sentence. So that's the subordinate clause is not a sentence on its own. It doesn't make sense on its own, but the main clause does make sense on its own. So if we take out who turned 64, so if we cross that out, the Pope left for Brazil last night. That makes sense on its own. The Pope, who turned 64 on Wednesday, left for Brazil last night. So that's our subordinate clause. Okay, let's look at the next sentence. After a long bath, Michelle decided to go to bed for the night. So which part is the subordinate clause? So, in this sentence, we've got um, two parts separated by a comma. So, which part would make sense without the other part? Michael decided to go to bed for the night. Excellent. So, this is our main clause. Michelle decided to go to bed for the night. This is our subordinate clause at the start of the sentence. After a long bath. Michelle decided to go to bed for the night. So we've got some extra information. We know she's going to bed, but we've got some extra information that tells us um, she's had a bath as well. After a long bath is not a sentence on its own. It needs, so the subordinate clause needs the main clause to make sense. Okay, let's look at the next one. Sensing a revolution, the president left in the middle of the night. Which part of that sentence is the subordinate clause? Sensing a revolution. Sensing a revolution. Sensing a revolution. Because that does not make sense on its own. It's additional information. So the president left in the middle of the night. That's our main clause. It makes sense on its own. But we've got some extra information about why he did that. Sensing a revolution. The president left in the middle of the night. But the sensing a revolution part is our subordinate clause. It doesn't make sense on its own. And subordinate clauses turn simple sentence into sentences into complex ones, and they are another indication of formality. So again, it's um enabling you to identify the formality of a text. Does Do the sentences in this text have subordinate clauses? Are they, so are they more complex sentences? If the answer is yes, then that is a more formal text. Okay, any questions about subordinate clauses? Okay, bias. What is bias in writing? So bias is when a writer leans towards one side of an argument or a debate more than the other. So it's what we might say one-sided. It can be slight or extreme. So um, previously you might have encountered these features images, repetition, euphemism, sarcasm, and the use of speech marks, and the use of pronouns. So, and they, all of those things can be used for bias too. So we're thinking about these features. Uh, Repetition, euphemism, sarcasm, use of speech marks and use of pronouns. So I want you to look at these sentences and can you spot how any of those features are used to um, show bias in the text?
So look at the first sentence. The basis of any good education is science, science, science. Have any of these features been used in that sentence? The basis of a good education is science, science, science. So uh, we're not we're going to ignore images because we don't have those. Um, have we got repetition, euphemism, sarcasm, or use of pronouns in that sentence? Oh, the basis of any good education is science, science, science. Repetition. Repetition. Excellent. Okay, so. The reason it can be used for bias is because it emphasizes that point. Okay, science, science, science is what the writer of this sentence thinks uh, makes a good education. So again, we're thinking about those same features. Repetition, euphemism, sarcasm and the use of speech marks and pronouns. We're looking at the next sentence. Prime Minister Smith, or Silly Billy, as I call him. So which of those features is used? Prime Minister Smith, or Silly Billy, as I call him. Sarcasm. Sarcasm. Well done. Silly Billy. It's being sarcastic. This England team is sure, in inverted commas, to win the World Cup. This England team is sure to win the World Cup. So does, does this writer genuinely believe that England will win the World Cup? What do you think? No. No. And how do you know that they don't? What word or what feature have they used? Sure. Yeah. What's, we've got inverted commas or speech marks around the word sure to show yeah. that they're being sarcastic. Well done. So final sentence. I may have dropped this vase, but it's their responsibility to pay for it. Sorry. So I may have dropped this vase, but it's their responsibility to pay for it. Which of those features has been used to show bias? I may have dropped this vase, but it's their responsibility to pay for it. Okay, so in this one, we've got the use of the word there that's stressed. I may have dropped this vase, but it's their responsibility to pay for it. Okay, so the use of that pronoun. So rather than the people's names, their responsibility. They're pointing the finger by using the pronoun. Any questions about that? Okay. So other ways to detect bias when reading. Exaggerated language. So, um, you know, it, it was utterly disgraceful. So not just it was very bad, it was utterly disgraceful. So trying to persuade us of their opinion by using that exaggerated language. The headlines and headings in a piece. Helping or hurting. A mission, one-sidedness, self or third-party interest. So 
let's have a look. So exaggerated language. Ignorant motorists who will not admit to the reality of climate change carry on driving everywhere, spewing filth and danger into the air. So what extreme words does he use there to show his bias? So what words have we got in this sentence that are um, exaggerated language that make clear this writer's opinion or bias? So we could have motorists will not admit to the reality of climate change. Motorists who will not admit to the reality of climate change carry on driving everywhere. But what words has he added to make uh, to sh make it more exaggerated? So how has he described the motorists? In ignorant. They're ignorant, good. How has he described the um, car fumes? So when someone drives, how, what has he described happening? So we've got spewing filth and danger. Okay, so we've got that exaggerated language. So uh, so you need to do some work now. So we've got some adjectives here. Hungry, old, good and cold. And I want you to think of some extreme adjectives that you could use instead of hungry. So what could you use instead of hungry? Darwin. Starving, good. Any others? So starving is a good famished, good. Okay, not sure about nervous, but there we go. Um old, what could we use instead of old? Illness. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that that you said? Elder. Elder, so elderly, yeah. Ancient. Ancient, good. So ancient, elderly, mature. What could we use instead of good? So if you think something's good, how could you show um, that you've, that you've, feel it's it's not just good it's really really good what's another word that you could use? excellent amazing excellent what about it Adam? what about excellent you can't use it excellent good good amazing yeah, excellent brilliant wonderful there's there's a lot of words you could use for good marvelous superb and so on okay cold Freezing. Oh, sorry. Freezing. <laughs> yeah. Freezing, perishing, bitter. Okay. Yeah. You need to meet me halfway with this, the job, with the journey in my head, because I have a journey in my head for this section of life. Okay. So, look at this headline. Wonder drug invented, it destroys fat cells. So writers want people to read their text so they'll encapsulate their piece with a headline. So they want to draw people in, so they put an eye-catching headline. In fact, they know that sometimes people only read the headline or heading. And it can also, as I mentioned, help them attract the audience they want. So 
The headline suggests a drug for weight loss has been invented. But the story underneath may reveal it's not been tested or has terrible side effects. So it destroys fat cells could just be a claim that a drug company has given. But the piece itself may explain more. So without reading the whole article, we don't know the truth of that sentence. It's just a way to draw us in and make us want to read on. So helping or hurting. A text may help or hurt a particular individual or group. So imagine there's been a demonstration against the government over civil rights. Which of these two texts helps the cause of the protesters? So it's biased towards them or it hurts them. So it's biased against them. So I'll read them out and then we'll decide. Peaceful demonstrators prepare to gather in their thousands to protest against the government's draconian new human rights bill. Police ready themselves for angry mob of dissatisfied agitators. So describing the same event, those two uh, sentences can make the reader feel very differently about this protest and they also show us the bias of the writer. So which of these texts is biased towards the protesters so would help the protesters? Which of those sentences is helpful to the protesters? Or it's positive towards them? The peaceful demonstration. Good. So why did you choose that one? What's helpful about it? Because with peace, we can achieve everything. So yeah, they so, are, uh, yeah. Yeah, so they, the word peaceful, good. And yeah, so we've got peaceful demonstrators. We've also got the government's bill described as draconian. So it's from the past. It's authoritarian. Okay. So... It, it's helpful to the cause of the protesters. So that means that the second sentence is biased against them. So people reading the second sentence may form a negative opinion of the protesters. What in that second sentence hurts the protesters? What language is used that is negative? The police ready themselves for angry mob of dissatisfied agitators. So can you tell me what negative language is used there? Angry. Angry, good. Agi agitated. Agitators. So they're not peaceful demonstrators, they are agitators. It's implying that they will be aggressive, they're looking for trouble. Okay, so the use of bias can help or hurt a particular individual or group. So omission, which means missing content. So missing, even minor omissions, um, can affect or change the meaning. So let's look at the obituary example. The actor died peacefully in his sleep. 
the star of so many wonderful films. He was loved by family and fans alike and will be sorely missed. So an obituary of a well-loved actor um, who was loved by his family and his fans. So this actor is presented as a well-respected person but what if the obituary neglected to mention that he went to prison for eight years for fraud? So we can see that omitting that eight years for fraud, that would ch that changes the tone. So if that was included, then it would change our feelings about this actor. It would it would change what we think of him. So let's look at the next one, the quote from the football manager. I've really enjoyed my time at the club, but the relegation was a low point. So um, when the manager was relegated, so we might think, oh, he's not a very good manager because he got relegated, the club got relegated. However, the full quote was, I've really enjoyed my time at the club, winning four league trophies, but the relegation was a low point. So when we include the um, four league trophies, then we think positively of him. So our opinion goes from negative to positive. So we can see there that omission can really affect the meaning. Okay. So you hear celebrities and, and people saying that they've been misquoted or um, a quote has been taken out of context. And that's what they mean. Because you can easily change the meaning of what someone has said by omission, by taking part of what they've said away, the meaning is altered. Any questions about that? So we've we've not got long left now. If you do need to leave because it's ten o'clock now, um, that's fine. You can catch up with the recording later. So one sidedness and lack of balance. A fair piece of text should be balanced and multi sided. So it should give both sides of an opinion or an argument, but it might not suit the writer's purpose to do that. So what's wrong with this extract? Mobile phones are a great invention. They allow users to be contacted at any time of the day. They mean you can be online anywhere in the world. They are small and portable, and you can download games onto them to play on the bus or train. So what's wrong with that extract? Is it a balanced piece? So if we wanted to learn about whether mobile phones are a good or bad thing, does that extract tell us? Does it show us both sides of the argument? So can anyone tell us what they think? Does that show us um, a balanced opinion about mobile phones? What do you think? Have we got all the information there to decide if phones are a good or bad invention? Yes, they is telling us that the phone the phone is good. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. So it only tells us that they are good. It only tells us positive things about mobile phones. There's no balance. So in a balanced article, 
the question might be asked, is it a good thing to be contactable 24 hours a day? Is it a good thing to always be online? Should you be able to play games on the bus and train and always be looking at your phone? So there's no balance there. But that's often used by the writer to try and um, make the reader think the same as them. If they only say one side of an argument, the reader doesn't have the opportunity to think about the negative arguments. Okay, so I'm going to read this advert out. You can read along. Why might you be suspicious of this so-called article? New treadmill to maximise your fitness. A new running machine has been devised that not only improves your fitness by 22%, but is also much gentler on your knees and other joints. The Runner Max 9000 from Gymnology is relatively unknown at the moment, but is set to take the fitness world by storm. The designer, Alan Filey, introduced the machine to a large and expectant crowd at Fitness Tech 2019 yesterday. And there's a photo there of someone on the machine, and underneath it says sponsored by Gymnology. So why would we be suspicious of this article? So does it does it give us a balanced view of the this new uh, running machine? Or to ask another question, who do you think might have written this article? So do you believe everything that's written there? So do any of you think, oh, yes, that sounds fantastic. I've got total faith. I want to use that running machine. It's amazing. Does anyone think that that's all true? So we've got we've still got seven people in this lesson. So does anybody think that that's totally believable, that article? No, because it doesn't have uh, deep information, you know, about the yeah. matter. It's only got one side of the information. Excellent. And what can you see in very tiny letters on that article at the bottom under the picture. What does it say? So here, oops. It said so, sponsored by Gymnology. So sponsored by this company, Gymnology. So if they are sponsoring the article, they're only going to tell us the good things. So it's self-interested. They are telling us about this new running machine because they want to sell it. Okay. It's written by someone with a vested interest in people reading it. It's sponsored by the company who have put the fitness equipment on the market. So they've paid somebody to write this article. If you do that in the UK, if a company pays for an article to be written in a magazine or newspaper, then it needs to be uh, labelled as such. So just like this here, sponsored by Gymnology, it needs to be included somewhere in the article. But by putting it in very, very small font, they're hoping people might not notice it. 
because they want people to just believe that a journalist thinks their running machine is amazing so that people will buy it. Okay, so matching examples to the feature. We're nearly at the end now. I know some of you will need to uh, get off. So, um, as a chairman of Rolls-Royce, I should know this is our best car yet. So which one of these features can we match it to? Let's let's have a look at the next one. People were beyond trembling with fear during the ordeal. Okay, let's let's start on the featured side. Let's look for one of these examples that uses informal language. So we're looking for contractions such as won't, didn't, can't. Yeah, we didn't. Uh, uh, informal language is uh, we can't visit there again. Good. Okay, well done. So... We can't visit there again, pal. Good. Sorry, my mouse is going to be. Um, formal language. So using um, so no contractions. More formal language. As chairman of Royal Royal, oh, that's not good. Well spotted. Yeah, so it's that one is it's the chairman. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's his self interest, then, isn't it? You spotted that. It's him that's saying it. Oops. Um. So formal language. This one here about Parliament. It is thought Parliament will push for their mandate tomorrow. It is thought, not I think or you think. It is thought mandate. Okay. Um. The new Nokia is light, fast, and easy to use with no downside. Is that balanced? Does that tell us everything about the Nokia or just one person's opinion? It's opinion. Yeah, so it's it's one-sided. Yeah. Um, so we're looking for one where something is missing and it's actually... Uh, actually yeah, that, that's... Uh, me, uh, they have some... Have Peter said it's mission or mission... Yes, the captain, good. So the captain said all problems were resolved immediately. And we can see by this, uh, I'm just putting an X on it here so you can spot it. Uh, this here, this use of um, punctuation, that something is missing. All problems were resolved immediately. But he could have said that all problems apart from the most serious ones. All problems apart from 99% of them. So we don't know what he said there. It could totally change the meaning. The unlikable singer, age 33, yes. claimed yeah. all night. Help or hurt that one, yeah. I think. Well, so. well done. Uh, people were trembling with fear during the ordeal. We're beyond trembling with fear. So I'm just going to speed Please. up. Now. Exaggeration. Yeah. Exaggeration. And yeah. have we got them all now? I think we might have done them all now. Okay, good. Well done. So let's just finish with our quiz. Analyzing a text means finding a specific piece of information, 
understanding inference, providing a sum summary, or examining it in detail. So if you I think so providing summary. Pardon? I think so providing summary, a summary. Analyzing so, the text means. So not providing See. a summary. So providing a summary of a text, you might do that after you'd analysed it. But to analyse it means that you are examining it in detail. Oh, so yeah. looking at the features, at the meaning, at the punctuation and grammar that's used, if it's biased and so on. So you're examining it in detail. So what is an appropriate response? What does that appropriate response mean? One that is fit for purpose in relation to the question asked. One that provides a significant level of detail. One that provides direct quotes. One that is totally comprehensive. So it's a tricky one that because um, we would want all of those things, really, but it's um, an appropriate response is fit for purpose in relation to the question asked. OK, so you've looked at the question. Does it ask for evidence? Um, does it ask for a specific opinion? Which document does it ask you to look at and so on? So it's fit for purpose. It tells you to use document A. So your evidence is fit for purpose, it's taken from document A. So it's A. Okay, thank you. We've reached the end now, so any questions? Okay, thank you for joining in and contributing today. As I mentioned, you can find lots of information online to help you practice. BBC Bite Size is always good for um, grammar and reading skills um, and so on so have a look at that and just keep reading during the week and looking for those features that we've talked about in our session and hopefully I will see most of you tomorrow for our writing lesson have a good day everyone thank you so much yes, thank you so much bye bye, bye.